Okay, all right, we are live now. Um, hi everyone, welcome to Ideas on the Verge. Um, my name is Mitch and I'm the host and just a quick word from our sponsors right now. So New Society Publishers is proud to be celebrating 40 years of activist solutions oriented publishing from their roots in nonviolent civil disobedience training during the Vietnam War to today, they continue to bring positive solutions and cutting edge ideas to some of the most troubling challenges of our time. Committed to building an ecologically sustainable and just society, they walk their talk by printing their books in North America, never overseas, and on 100% post-consumer recycled paper. They are carbon neutral and have been since 2006, and their employees are all shareholders and they're a certified B corporation. If you want to find out more, head on over to newsociety.com. And today I have a very special guest. His name is Mitch Marchand. He's an electrical engineer who started the Calgary company EMF Aware. And at EMF Aware, Mitch conducts, no pun intended, complete home electromagnetic frequency assessments, pre-purchase home EMF inspections, power line, electromagnetic frequency exposure assessments, cell tower assessments, smart meter assessments, and more, including some assessments around dirty electricity, earthing product inspection, workplace EMF, and consultations around how to build a low EMF house. And from one Mitch to another, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well, Mitch. This is great. Glad, glad to be on. Well, yeah, glad to have you here. Um, so I guess, I guess first things first, there might be some viewers who might be unfamiliar with what electromagnetic radiation is. So could, um, I mean, I'm particularly interested in hearing what you have to say that, about that as an electrical engineer. So, Sure. So, you know, electromagnetic fields is just like another force and it's just like, you know, gravity, for example. Right. And there are natural forms and, and unnatural forms. So at one end of the spectrum, we have something that's very simple that everyone knows about. It's how compasses work. It's the DC field of the, of the earth, right? And that's how compasses use. That's how birds migrate and, and, and get direction. And it's, and, it's, and it's around us all the time. And um, then there's things like human created uh, electromagnetic fields, such as electricity, right? Which operates at 60 Hertz or 60 vibrations per second. Um, and then there's some things called wireless technology, right? That's how your AM, FM radio work. That's how the Wi-Fi and wireless devices in our environment work. Those operate, you know, in the thousands or millions or billions of, of vibrations per second or Hertz. Um, and then we have things like light. Light is a natural form of, uh, you know, EMF. Um, and it just so happens to be one that we can see and that we've adapted to. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we keep going up further, we get into things called ionizing radiation, which is gamma rays, x-rays, and, and things like that. So the whole kit and caboodle there is called electromagnetic fields. Um, and there's natural forms and, uh, and uh, unnatural forms or human created ones. And um, in our assessments and things like that, we mostly focus on the human created ones, try to eliminate those as much as possible and get it to a kind of a natural state as possible. Um, so yeah, so that's a quick and dirty of what is electromagnetic fields. Cool. Um, so when I, w I just watched your um, presentation and it felt, um, which Ben will provide a YouTube link to that in the chat. Um, and I feel like now that I'm looking around me, every I'm just being bombarded by unnatural electromagnetic radiation. And so is that bad? <laughs> yeah. So basically my background <clears throat> is I took some training that was basically a German curriculum that was translated into English. And they've been looking at these things for, you know, over 40 years. And what they found is they initially did like 3000 studies, right, on people's homes and what they had to do to make people feel better, right? And what they found was the closer they got to nature, the better people felt, mm -hmm. okay? And then they extended that to 10,000 studies. And this was with doctors, physicists, engineers, and it was headed by a journalist, right? So mm -hmm. 
they expanded that to 10,000 and they still keep, were coming up with the, with, with the same thing. The closer we get to nature, the better people felt. So building biology is, a, is, a, is just a, a principle-based approach to, to reducing these, these, these sources. And, and it looks at indoor air quality, water quality, healthy building, um, you know, a little bit of building science and electromagnetic fields. So the, the closer we get to nature, the better people feel. And I think just a lot of people now are just in this kind of this new normal, right? Especially, you know, in the, in during COVID where they're staying at home, they're, they're, they're in an environment for very long periods of time. So, you know, things like Wi-Fi in the home might be having more of an effect on them than if they were going more outside or, or commuting even, or, or, or going out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when we look at kind of the, the health effects from, from these uh, electromagnetic fields, they kind of fall into three simple categories. One is cancer, right? And sometimes the latency period is like 10 to 20 years, um, but there's certain, certain types of cancer. There's, 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 there's breast cancer, there's leukemias. Um, you know, people who live next to the high voltage tension lines, childhood leukemia rates are two to four times higher. And that's what caused Whoa. the World Health Organization to consider electromagnetic fields from power lines as a possible human carcinogen, um, right? And then in 2011, the World Health Organization considered wireless radiation or cell phones and Wi-Fi as a possible human carcinogen as well. So this is in the same category as DDT and, and, and some other chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it is a thing. Um, so the cancers, right? And then the other big thing is fertility. Um, there's like over 191 studies on sperm virility going, reducing dramatically when you have a cell phone, like in your pocket for males and there's increasing studies done on, on what's happening on, on the, uh, with the ovaries on the female side of things. Um, and, uh, it's just, you know, the general tip is if you're planning to have kids, try to keep those cell phones away from those key areas for three months, right? That's the, the amount of time it takes for the, the sperm to regenerate. Um, with that. And then the last thing is this kind of this more ambiguous grouping. And it has to do with neurological conditions and hormones. Um, so, you know, neurological conditions like MS, Parkinson's, um, so on, their symptoms send, tend to be exacerbated when they're exposed to electromagnetic fields it may not be the root cause of it, but it just makes things worse. Um, things, other things is ADHD um, can, can, can be, uh, can be exacerbated um, in, in these cases and also just different hormones like sleep wake cycles. So melatonin production, um, you know, and the downstream effect of these is kind of like foggy brain headaches, insomnia, um, and those type of conditions. And, um, and what we're finding is even small amounts for long periods of time, it's the cumulative effect of these things that's really catching up to us and that, that's having the effect. Um, they're not really concerned about your exposure for a day, month, or a year, but it's that 5, 10, 15, 20 year accumulation of even low levels um, can have an impact. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking about um, what you said about um, with it, regards to our reproductive organs. Would it generally be best if we kept our cell phones completely out of our pockets, just as a general baseline health consideration? Yeah, yeah. What, what's, what's, what's impressive is whether you have a cell phone, right? Or a Wi-Fi router or any other wireless device, every time you double your distance from it, you reduce your exposure 400% or fourfold. So the difference between holding your cell phone up to your head and putting it on speakerphone three feet away from you is a 50 fold reduction in exposure. So it's well, huge, right? So distance is your friend a lot of the times when it comes to these type of things. Yeah. Where would you recommend people keep their cell phone? Yeah, so, um, you know, ideally we would have it as far away as possible from us. So, you know, if you're sitting at a desk for most of your day, you know, you can probably have it 10 feet away from you. Um, you'll still hear it ring. Um, it depends also how you use your phone. Some people use it as a primary communication method. So they're on it a lot. Uh, but keeping it as far away as possible um, is great. When it comes to sleeping areas, uh, environmental medicine doctors are recommending 30 feet from your bed if you have to have it on. 
um, and to keep it in airplane mode if you don't need to have the actual the ability for someone to call you or text you in the middle of the night. Okay. Um, so those are just some general rules of thumb. Cool. And now that we're on to that, what about um, having, because I know electricity is kind of emanating from, or EMF is emanating from lamps, from all sorts of things, even when they're off. Um, would you, do you unplug your lamps beside your bed before going to bed or? Yeah, so so just to break that down a little bit. Um, so when we look at the the electromagnetic fields from electrical wiring, for example, in your home, mm-hmm. um, there's two things that we're primarily concerned about. One's called an electric field and one's called a magnetic field. So if you can picture a lamp and you plug it into the wall, um, and the analogy we use is a fireman holding a fire hose with the nozzle off. So when you plug in the lamp, there's electrical pressure to that on-off switch which is the same as a fireman hooking up the fire hose to the hydrant, turning the hydrant on with the nozzle off. There's water pressure in that hose. So mm-hmm. same thing happens when you plug in the lamp into the, into the outlet, there's electrical pressure up to the on off switch. That electrical pressure is called voltage. And where, whenever we have a voltage, it creates an electric field, probably six to eight feet away from there. And the effect of that is, is anything within that six to eight feet of that energized wire will have a voltage if you're conductive, it'll have a voltage induced on it. So we're conductive by nature and there's a voltage that'll get induced on the surface of your skin as a result of this interaction. Um, So for example, in your sleeping areas, we usually see about 1.2 to 1.6 volts of AC electricity coupled onto you. And it's something you can just measure with a multimeter, uh, right? You use, you plug in one probe into the third prong of the outlet, you hold the other one, and you can measure the voltage difference between those two points. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, at my house, what I do is I just turn off the breakers um, and de-energize my whole room. So if I had lamps plugged into to the wall, it doesn't really matter uh, for me, um, but we, we turn off the, the, the breakers. And the idea behind that is the cells in our body, the difference between the voltage difference between inside of our cell and the outside of our cell is typically like a hundred millivolts or 40 millivolts, right? And what we typically have on a person's uh, surface of their skin while they're sleeping is usually 1,200 millivolts or 1,600 millivolts. We've seen as high as 9,000 millivolts. And that's just adding some bioelectric noise to your body. Um, and this is stuff that doesn't naturally occur. We don't have 60 Hertz voltage on our body naturally. Um, so if we go out in the middle of the mountains and measure this, it'd be zip. It'd be zero. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Um, I guess backtrack a little bit. How, how did you get into this? What was there a Eureka moment that was like, Oh, uh, this is actually really important and I want to dedicate my life's work to it. Yeah. So, um, like most people who are doing this type of work, it's usually themselves or a loved one who got hurt, <laughs> right? And had to make a health struggle through it. Um, so what happened with me was when my wife moved into my 600 square foot condo in downtown Calgary, mm-hmm. uh, she started getting kind of chronically ill. She felt like she was getting um, jolted out of her sleep. Um, and she's a naturopathic doctor. She was somebody who was extremely healthy beforehand. And so she was running all these labs, like hormone panels and different tests just to try to figure out what the heck was going on here. And, um, and yeah, it wasn't until she kind of thought back to some of her environmental medicine training where they said, you know, sometimes these electromagnetic fields, the human created ones, um, can have an impact on on your health. Um, so she bought this little EMF meter and brought it to the new clinic that she was also moved into thinking that it was her workplace. And nothing came up there. And when she brought home the the meter, the readings were just off the charts. Um, So then we made the decision actually pretty quickly to just move. Um, And two weeks later, we were in a new place and her symptoms all went away. So it was, you know, as, as an electrical engineer at the time, I was like, you know, what is going on here? And um, the more and more I looked into it, the, the more things started to line up, you know, I, I knew how transformers and, and, and electricity worked. And, you know, I didn't realize that we're conductive by nature as well. And the same principles apply to that stuff as it applies to us. So I took some envir- I took some building biology training to the building biology Institute, which I'm now an instructor with um, in the U S 
and um and yeah just kind of had a you know just an abrupt life change of life purpose at that time so we started a naturopathic clinic with my wife and i started doing the emf assessments at the same time amazing yeah because i mean to a lot of people this might just seem like science fiction like oh no it's fine but turns out there's actually shocking figures that can lead to actual health implications so how common are these really high exposure areas and what can we do better to educate people on this? Yeah. So, um, the, the environments that we have just in our home, for example, um, and specifically our sleeping areas. So our sleeping areas is where our body kind of rest recovers and repairs from the day, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't get a good, good enough sleep, you're kind of taking a step back the next day. Right. And if that keeps happening, right. Um, it's pretty hard to, uh, to heal, recover and repair. So what we find is in people's um, sleeping area specifically is there's a, 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 a um, it's called the, the Tory Jelter and Sage, uh, Cindy Sage protocol. And it's really simple. And it's in the, uh, the free resources um, link that we're going to send out at the end of the, um, um, that people have access at the end of this, this talk. But right, in the chat right now, actually. Perfect. It's really simple. Um, it involves like three or four steps and it increases, um, it was originally designed for kids with autism and they found that 80% of the kids showed significant improvements within two weeks of implementing this. And it's something that everybody could start doing tonight. There's, there's nothing you need to buy. There's nothing you need to <laughs> do. Um, and what it involves is turning the Wi-Fi off at night, turning the shutting off your cordless phones or unplugging your cordless phones. So if you have a cordless phone, you can just get a corded phone from Staples for 10 bucks. Um, it involves removing any baby monitors at night as well. And turning off the breaker that controls the lights and the outlets in the bedrooms. And uh, I, I'd always add another step onto that is I just ask people to put their phone in airplane mode, mm -hmm. uh, their cell phones in, in airplane mode. And this, this protocol works great for, uh, for 80% of the, the kids, um, that, that may have autism, but it also works really great for improving people's quality of sleep. Um, it's the one thing that Rob Avis called me back six months after doing his assessment. And, uh, he says, Mitch, you'll never believe this. I've been struggling with my sleep for a couple of months. And then I remembered, you told me which breakers to turn off, uh, to my bedroom. And I was going to go see all these doctors. And when I did that, that night, I had the most amazing sleep ever. And you just had to call me to, to, to let me know that. Um, so when you turn off the breakers to your, to your bedroom, just always make sure that your system critical things like your smoke detector, your furnace, your fridges, your freezers, um, carbon monoxide detectors, radon systems, all that system critical stuff is still working. Mm -hmm. If it is, um, then it's a, uh, a good first step. And uh, when we go into people's homes, we do it a little more surgically. Um, there's usually about a couple other breakers other than just the outlets and lights that we need to turn off to get it down as low as reasonably possible. Uh, but turning off the breakers to the outlets and the lights, it's a good first step. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, so th that's just kind of the simple stuff that everyone can do. And there's other things that could be going on, but that's just the simple stuff. Yeah. So like, what is it about... Uh, electromagnetic frequency that really messes with us on like a molecular level is there anything you've identified that's like okay this is um i know you've talked a little bit about resonant frequencies at least in that one presentation but I'm just, is what is that and like does everyone have a different resonant frequency do we are you finding that some people are more susceptible to the adverse effects of electromagnetic radiation than others or yeah so um what we know is Electromagnetic fields create oxidative stress. It doesn't matter what type of electromagnetic field it is. If you're out in the sun too long, uh, there's this process in our body called oxidative stress. It's important for signaling and repairing, and it's just a natural process. But when we're exposed to electromagnetic fields, we get more oxidative stress than we would otherwise. And it doesn't matter if it's dirty electricity, if it's wireless radiation if it's if it's stuff from electricity it all kind of has this oxidative stress 
And Igor Yakomenko uh, did a study of studies, uh, basically a meta-analysis. He looked at over 200 research papers on um, oxidative stress just related to wireless radiation, typically what we get from our Wi-Fi and cell phones. And what he found universally was there's increased oxidative stress uh, in humans, animals, and plants. Uh, so that's across the board. Mm -hmm. um, there's other mechanisms. There's uh, voltage-gated calcium channels that they're looking into. But the oxidative stress is just a general catch-all for, for all of these. Um, so, you know, this low level stress will kind of express itself differently with different people with different constitutions. It's just like people who we eat, if we had two people, um, one person was super skinny and that's all they ate were, was, was potato chips, for example. And then we had somebody who was bigger who ate, who just looked at potato chips and it seemed like they were getting bigger. Eating potato chips for both of those people is a stress on their body. It just expresses it in different ways. Okay. And electromagnetic fields are exactly the same way. So what we do find, though, is there's these precursors. They're not causes, but there's these general trends that we see in people um, who may be more affected by the electromagnetic fields. And we find people with heavy metals or mercury amalgams uh, just tend to be uh, more affected. Um, you know, this may be because, you know, the, the mercury inside of us just absorbs more of the radiation if you have more metal inside you, you absorb more, more of the radiation. Uh, we find people who have uh, had uh, some sort of electrocution or struck by lightning, um, some sort of event like that, or it could be just like a, a, an overexposure to radio frequencies, like a, a radar operator or, or, you know, somebody who's been exposed for something like an extreme exposure to, to, to wireless um, uh, technology. Um, then we have uh, people who are just exposed to mold, um, uh, people who have immune compromised, especially Lyme. Uh, we find that uh, they, they, are, they are more exposed. And there's probably a few other ones that, uh, that I'm not thinking about. But those are just, just general precursors. And those people just tend to be, you know, their spider senses tingle a little bit more um, when they're exposed to these, these type, of, uh, type of fields. Crazy. Um, you, you highlighted in the presentation of uh, something about dirty electricity. Yeah. What is, how can electricity be, be dirty? Yeah. So dirty electricity is just essentially electrical noise on your electrical system. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, if you're, if you have it, an, if you're tuned into an AM radio station and, and you're driving through a thunderstorm, you'll hear the cracks and crackles of, 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 of the lightning storm. Right. And that's just electrical noise in the air. And you have the similar thing go on with dirty electricity in, in your home and things that create dirty electricity um, are um, things like dimmer switches. Dimmer switches actually chop up the electrical signal. Right. To dim, to, to dim the light. Um, what we're seeing is there's more variable speed drives in, for example, your furnace. And depending on the filtering that comes with that furnace, it could create a lot of electrical noise if it's not filtered properly. Um, and then all electronics, anything with a circuit board in it, they all run on DC electricity. That's how, that's how the circuit boards operate. And what's fed in your home is a different form of electricity called AC electricity. And to convert one to the other is a noisy process. It creates electrical noise. And sometimes it's filtered out and sometimes it's not properly. So no, um, it's like isn't filtered at all. Say that again. That noise in that conversion isn't filtered and it just goes everywhere. Well, it can be filtered. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's filtered better than others. Um, and we find it quite highly variable, right? Even in light bulbs, for example, the LED light bulbs have to convert the AC electricity into DC electricity because that's what LED light bulbs work on is DC electricity. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we can grab one light bulb X from Home Depot or from wherever. We plug it in. We test it. It's like, oh, this one isn't so bad. Then we go to the store and grab a few other ones of the same type and we screw them in. And if they're from a different production run, they might actually change one of the components to save a, a penny here or there on, on the components when they run this, you know, a hundred thousand at a time. And those changes can actually change what, how much dirty electricity those, those light bulbs give off. 
So we find it's really, you know, kind of a crapshoot when it comes to lighting. Um, you know, the, the type of lighting that you use um, is just highly variable unless you're using something like the old school incandescent light bulbs or, or um, in other cases, halogen lights that run off of the AC um, electricity. Those ones there are by far the healthiest and the most consistent. I don't have to worry about brands or anything. It's just a filament um, and those don't create any dirty electricity and they have a nice warm orange glow to them. So there's no blue light that we see in LEDs and compact fluorescents. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So would you would you generally recommend people um, purchase those light bulbs relative to ones that have to convert to a DC current? Yeah, that, that's kind of what we're moving people towards. Is even in when we do new build consultants, um, we like to have the ability to screw in or put in the incandescent or halogen lights that work off 120 volts. Um, and then later on have the ability to swap those out for LEDs when we have like a, a good cleaner version of it. And the LEDs are improving every, every year. Um, they're just not quite there as far as, um, you know, consistency goes. Um, there, there, there's, too, um, there's too much variability in them. But what we usually recommend is the places where you spend before you go to bed, like an hour or two before bed, try to have those outfitted with mostly incandescent light bulbs as much as possible. Bedrooms, bathrooms. If you have a place where you chill out and you like to read or something before you go to bed, those type of places, those are the ones that are really important uh, for, uh, for getting rid of all the blue light that kind of can impede our melatonin production, which affects our sleep-wake cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the biggest things. And then if you have CFLs in your house, um, a lot of people don't know that's compact fluorescence. Those are the little ones with the corkscrew. Mm -hmm. um, those ones there contain mercury. Um, and if those actually break in your house, it's really difficult to get that mercury out. Um, so the state of Maine did this study where they broke compact fluorescent on carpet, vacuumed up that same spot for up to uh, for 28 days. When they put their foot down and they measured the mercury levels where they put the foot down close to the carpet, exceeded the state of Maine's um, guidelines for mercury exposure, which is the same, pretty much the same for, for Canada. So it's really hard to get that out of your home once it's in there. Um, and there is also the compact fluorescents create, most of the time they create some significant dirty electricity. Um, some, they're now starting to put filtering into compact fluorescents, but there's flicker with them as well. And the quality of light is quite poor. There's a, there's a lot of blue and green light uh, that doesn't mimic what actually naturally occurs. Um, so that can affect people as well. So get those out of your house if you can. Yeah. Um, I've got, got a question because I've, I've got some Philips Hue light bulbs, which I understand are LEDs. And if you can change the wavelength of that light to be um, more red, say, I've just been reading that because, uh, have you read um, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker? I haven't. It's on my list. Uh, it's so yeah, yeah. Absolutely changed my life. But um, I I bought a Philips Hue light to go red. So when I'm reading in bed, um, I thought I was doing myself a favor by giving myself red light. But with, would you say that the um, the benefit of having that red light is, you know, cancels out is canceled out by the fact that it's an LED. Yeah, so what we find when we actually look at these LED lights with the spectrometer, and the spectrometer basically reads how much red, green, blue, basically the whole spectrum, how much light is coming off of those. What we find with all LED lights is they have this little bump in the blue, mm -hmm. right? And then the rest of it is, 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 is pretty okay. But even a warm orange glow LED light LED, LEDs, in order to make those colors, they have to mix colors, right, mm -hmm. in order to get that. And all LED lights that we've measured have this blue bump in it, right? Versus if we were to look at this on the spectrometer for like candle light, for example, it has zero blue and mostly orange and red in it. Mm -hmm. So if you really wanted to kind of test this out, um, what you want to get is an infrared light bulb right? So those are kind of an incandescent type of type of light bulb and they just produce red and that's it. That's it. Right. Versus the Philips hue one. If you, it doesn't matter. Philips, you know, 
any yeah. LED light mixes colors in order to get that warm color tone, right? If it's a, if it's a, a colder temperature, which means it looks more white or bluish, yeah, it's going to have much more blue in it. But even the reds and, and the oranges have that blue bump in them, which is less than ideal, but. I've been duped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, it's you know, there, 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 it's, it's all, all a spectrum of how, you know, how far you want to take it, right? But if, if you just get an infrared light bulb, try that out. There's a bunch of other health benefits from, from doing that as well, so. Okay, cool. Um, well, it, that poses a lot of interesting questions. Um, I know a lot of food is grown with LEDs and can, do you, can you comment on any of the implications that different kinds of lights have on growing food, say indoors? I mean, a lot of people are going to urban farming and this will require a lot of indoor lighting. And this is opening up a lot of questions for what the uh, effects that light will have on that food. Do you have anything to say on that? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's not really my area of expertise, but I know that there is, you know, the spectrometers that, 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 that we purchased to, to, to measure these lights and stuff like that. There's one specifically geared for growing things. Right. And they have specific parameters that they're, that they're looking at, which is different than for humans. Um, right. And we know kind of in general, a kind of a long-term strategy that we found is usually what happens in nature uh, usually ends up being um, the most optimal, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, and I know the, the, the lights look, you know, when you look at these different uh, greenhouses and things like that, you know, the grow lights look much different, right? Sometimes they have this like purplish kind of hue to them um, and, and, and they do that. And that might be very specific to certain plants, but that's a little bit outside of my, my expertise. I know for humans, uh, we just operate uh, so much better on natural light um, and, uh, and nice warm orange and, and yellow glows after the sun sets. Um, and that's what kind of makes us operate optimally, but, but plants might have sl slightly different needs. Mm -hmm. Man, I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> with, uh, and I'll be bouncing around a lot here cause this is really, uh, uh, bringing some stuff up, but what about, um, headphones like wireless headphones are, you know, there's some, or just wireless anything, even wireless video game controllers. Um, like a lot of people will be playing video games with the controller right in their lap near the reproductive organs. Um, or I notice you've got a corded headset. Um, yeah. Is there a reason that you have a corded headset rather than a wireless one? Yeah, so the, uh, so the wireless, you know, headphones that you see a lot of people put in their ears. Um, the interesting thing about that is um, there's a transmitter in one, there's a transmitter in the other, and then there's a transmitter on your phone, mm -hmm. right? So just like your phone, you know, every time you double your distance from it, you reduce your exposure fourfold. Well, every time you half your distance, you're increasing it fourfold, right? So what we find with those earbuds is the exposure is extremely high because you have a transmitter here, a transmitter here, and a third transmitter on your phone. So you're kind of getting a triple whammy. And the two are extremely close to your body or inside your ear canal. Um, so what we find with those ones is, you know, the exposures are um, extremely high. Um, and um, that's not a good long-term solution for <laughs> listening to music or, or telephone calls or, or things like that, um, you know. Um, I, and what's really even popular now is, um, there's certain noise cancellation ones that people use when their partners are snoring, um, as well. So they'll have like this long-term duration, uh, where they just put those in, they may not even be listening to anything, uh, but they're still transmitting, um, a, a, a signal. And the interesting thing about these signals, whether it be from Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cell phones is it's a digitized pulse, right? So if you think of your microwave oven, your microwave oven operates at almost the same frequency as one of the bands of Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your microwave oven is a shielded box. Okay. But it has no information on it. Right. So we're from an environmental medicine perspective, we're allowed to be exposed to a hundred times more radiation from your microwave oven 
than we can from Wi-Fi and cordless phones. And the reason for that is the Wi-Fi, cordless phones, um, Bluetooth, they're digitized signals. They're sending the information, the ones and zeros as pulses. And that pulses is just more biologically annoying to the body. Our body likes to see slow undulating um, signals, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why we're supposed to be exposed to a hundred times less uh, from our cell phones, our, our wireless devices, from an environmental medicine perspective, then from, you know, FM radio, which is more analog, it has some digitized components and, and microwave ovens. Um, and it's that digitized signal in the, those pulses is what's more biologically annoying to our body. Okay. Interesting. Are there any risks associated with microwaves? Um, so microwaves is wireless radiation, just like everything else. So um, the interesting thing is that you have to always take in consideration the duration, right? So if you look at your Wi-Fi router, which is transmitting 24 seven, whether you're using it or not, it's actually transmitting 10 times a second, just its network ID, 10 times a second. So what, if, you, if, you, if you were to hear it go 10 dits per second. And if you were to listen to your microwave oven, it would be only when it's on, it'd be like this sound. Mm -hmm. And so your duration, people oftentimes don't use their microwave oven for long durations. They might use it to warm up their coffee. They might use it to, you know, very short durations. So I usually don't sweat the microwaves in people's homes. The interesting thing about microwave ovens is the older the microwave oven is, the poor the seal is around them mm -hmm. and they will allow more radiation to, to come out. So don't be looking into the microwave as it's cooking. Um, that I wouldn't recommend. And uh, if you have small kids and that type of thing, uh, and if you have one of those microwave ovens that is mounted underneath the counter, I would just keep them away from the, the microwave oven while it's running. Um, that is a significant exposure, most likely. Mm -hmm. Um but, uh, but when you compare it to what your Wi-Fi router is, I'm much more concerned about that 24 seven, you know, you don't escape that, that exposure and it's there all the time. Mm -hmm. So say you have um, some roommates and they are working late or something and, but you, you want to go to bed and you want to turn the Wi-Fi off. Is there, are there any um, sort of micro scale solutions or, I mean, like room-based solutions that you can implement to um, kind of ref reflect those those waves um, out of your location. Yeah, yeah. So the, the 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 kind of the solutions that we try to move people towards in in homes, for example, there's there's the home example, and then there's the condo example or the apartment example, and they're they're kind of two separate kind of scenarios. In, in a home example, you know, what we try to do is we try to hardwire as much as possible, right? Your hardwired connection will be by far your most stable and your fastest internet connection in your home. Mm -hmm. And if we can hardwire that, that's great. So if you can run an ethernet cable from your router to your laptop or to your iPad or to your TV or to your Apple TV or your Roku or your printer, all those, that would be great. Just remember, once you hook it up to your laptop, put your laptop into airplane mode or else it's still transmitting its Wi-Fi signal um, mm -hmm. unnecessarily. Um, there are other solutions where you can repurpose the coax cable, which is your TV cable in your house for ethernet. Uh, so this is a, a great tool in, in older homes that don't have ethernet um, in, in the different homes or in mm -hmm. the different rooms. So you, you can use something called a Mocha adapter to do that. Um, and then there's other ones called power line communication devices, which transmit over the, over the electrical wires. I don't recommend those. Those basically increase your dirty electricity exposure because that's how they work. They modulate your, the, electrical, um, the electricity in your home to send data, which is basically creating electrical noise um, on, on your wiring system. So those are kind of dealing with the root cause. Um, the kind of the band-aid solutions that work is Christmas light timers on your Wi-Fi router or setting up a schedule in your Wi-Fi router to turn on and off. Um, those can work or simply just putting on a power bar and turning it off and on. 
Um, so those are the, the, the simple things. If you're in kind of a, a condo type of scenario, you can usually, or, or a smaller area, you can usually dial back the power output of your Wi-Fi router as well. Um, usually they're, by default, they're just all set to high. Um, and if you're in a small area, you can just dial that back down to a low. And we've seen the reduction. Um, uh, we, we're, we're testing this out for classrooms right now, but we find if we dial back the power output to 15 or 16 percent, it still will serve up the, the, the classroom. And it's like an 80 to 90 percent reduction in exposure when we do that with no, um, no side effects of connectivity issues um, uh, in the classroom. So, so, so that can be significant. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it might be just putting it on a Christmas light timer. Um, or if you can get a hardwired connection, that would be, that, that, that deals with the root cause if possible. Yeah. I'm just thinking, uh, in the instance of condos, uh, you've got a lot of neighbors who might not be as EMF aware. And aside from like covering your, your walls and tinfoil, um, is there any way you can, reduce your exposure to that? Yeah, so in, in condos, um, what our kind of go-to solution is for the sleeping areas is a bed canopy. So a bed wow. canopy is something that in, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, a, it's just a canopy, like a mosquito net that goes over top of your bed. Yeah. And you have to put a sheet underneath your bed as well uh, to shield from the bottom. Um, but it's just one of those simple solutions where you can put up in an afternoon and the way it works is like you alluded to when we're dealing with wireless technology, we're basically reflecting the signals away. That's how we shield from it. And what they do is they take a silver thread, they wrap it in cotton and then weave it into uh, a fabric. So that fabric is basically a fine metal mesh and the signals get reflected off of that fine metal mesh. So um, putting up these bed canopies in, in people's sleeping areas is, is often the simplest thing to do. There's other things like paint. There's a, there's a graphite paint out there that you can paint your walls. Um, and then you can put the curtains using the same fabric that the canopy is made out of over, over your windows if, if something's coming in from, from that direction. Um, but those are often um, just take much longer time to, to implement. And you should be grounding the paint and, and, and a few other things. Um, you know, and you have to paint the casings of the windows. You have to do the baseboards. You have to paint the door. Um, so there's just a few bunch of extra steps in there versus buy the canopy, throw it up in an afternoon, and you're done. Yeah. Um, type of thing. So. And what is that canopy made out of? Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's a... Um, there's different materials, but the most common one is, is, is using a silver thread. So it's a silver thread that's wrapped in cotton mm -hmm. and woven into a fabric. So it basically is creating a fine metal mesh over your bed, mm -hmm. kind of like the Faraday cage approach. Yeah. Um, but it actually feels like cotton uh, with it. And it, people are always surprised with like, you know, they're looking for something that kind of looked like tinfoil or something, but it's it literally, you can't tell the difference between a fabric and, and this stuff. So yeah. I'm just thinking we should be lying our pockets for this. Uh, sorry, the, your office? No, the, my pockets are, oh, like my pants pockets. Is that a viable thing for people to do or designers to do? Is... Um, yeah. So, so there's, there's, you know, there's people, I think lambs is a, is, is a product out there that does boxer shorts and, and underwear and there's, there's singlets or, or, um, you know, undershirts. Um, that a lot of people wear, um, you know, Swiss shield natural has a wear product. That's just a white that's meant to be, uh, um, uh, used in, in, in clothing. Uh, some people who are electrically hypersensitive, if they go on planes or way back when, when they would go on planes, they wear a hoodie made out of this material. Um, and they found that that really helped them out. Um, and, you know, some people are putting, you know, there's some people who are just accustomed to putting their uh, phone in their jacket pocket or in certain areas. Right. And some of my clients have, you know, sewn in this, this material in those, in, in those pockets. Um, so that, that, that's kind of a bandaid solution in, in, in my mind. Um, there may be some other secondary effects by still having that in there. 
Um, but that is one option. There's, there are phone cases um, that, that, that work. The way that the phone cases work is they usually have a flap on them. Mm-hmm. And the flap is the part that's actually shielded. So you open it up, you make the call, then you close this, and then you put it up. So then it's reflecting the waves away from you. Uh, but I only recommend that for people who are pretty diligent about it. If you slide it in your pocket like this and the, and the flap is here, it's going to radiate back towards you, kind of give you the, make your exposure worse versus if you slide in your pocket this way, right? And the flap is at the back, it's going to reflect it away. So you just have to be a little bit diligent of, of how you use those. Yeah. Do you imagine in, uh, in the future that there will be warning labels on phones and wireless headphones and whatnot about the effects of electromagnetic radiation? Uh, electromagnetic kind of like their um are warning labels on um cigarette packages or or alcohol yeah so uh in berkeley in california they actually do have that and uh on the packaging and it's a requirement um and in everybody's phone there is a safe distance in which it says in the manual to actually hold it so all these phones, none of them are tested with it right up against your skin. They're all tested at a set distance away. Sometimes it's five millimeters, sometimes it's 20 millimeters, um, but they're never tested against your head. If you're using it against your head, it is most likely exceeding even the safety guidelines that were made in the seventies, right? So, um, so all cell phones are meant to be kept at a safe distance. If you look for like, uh, tablets and laptops, it's sometimes 20 centimeters, right? So sometimes it's not actually supposed to be on your lap. And it, it says this in, in, in the documentation, right? This device was tested at this level. It should not be put any closer to you than that distance. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, what the manufacturers say in the fine print and how people actually use the devices is always much different. Um, and a lot of people just aren't aware of, of, of kind of the, the nitty gritty details of how these devices are tested and, and what's considered safe or not. Yeah, I definitely classify myself as someone's EMF unaware. That- yeah. 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 And kind of one of the interesting things about, you know, the, the safety guidelines, right? So um, I, when, when, I, when we go into people's homes, we often explain to them what the different safety guidelines are. So in Canada, we have safety code six. In the US, they have the the FCC uh, guidelines. But our exposure levels of what we're allowed to be exposed to in Canada for like, let's just say, and cell phones and Wi-Fi is about 4.3 million and the units are microwatts per meter squared. Um, 40% of the population of the earth have safety guidelines at 100,000 not 4.3 million. So whole order of magnitude lower. Mm -hmm. So our guidelines are based on taking a six foot two, 220 pound mannequin, which was the 90th percentile of the military at the time. And they expose this mannequin to one frequency. In your phone, you have two bands of Wi-Fi, soon to be three. You have Bluetooth and you have several bands of, uh, of cellular frequencies that it operates at. So they took this 220 pound, six foot two mannequin, exposed them to one frequency over a period of six minutes and increased that intensity until the temperature increased one degree Celsius and then put in a safety factor of five, 10 or hundred. So that 4.3 million exposure level is only protecting you from overheating, right? Similar to the microwave oven that operates at the yeah. same frequency as one of your Wi-Fi, right? It's a thermal effect only. And that was done in the seventies based on information that was 10 years old from one frequency. So 40% of the population of the earth have safety guidelines at a hundred thousand. And that's due to three hours or longer durations. Okay. This includes, you know, the oxidative stress that we talked about, mitochondrial dysfunction, opening up the blood brain barrier and those type of things. So then we get down to um, some of the other more uh, precautionary principles, or even like the environmental medicine doctors in Europe, these are board certified doctors in Europe. Mm-hmm. They want to see safety guidelines um, during the day of a hundred or less. 
not a hundred thousand, just a hundred and 10 or less at night. Yeah. So that's a much larger, that's a whole other order of magnitude below. Yeah. And the whole thing, if you do the sanity check on this, is this even realistic, right? Let's say the average home that I go into in Calgary here has an exposure level of between 200 and 5,000. Mm -hmm. That's an average exposure in, in, in a sleeping area. So now, 200 to 5,000. 200 to 5,000. That's an average exposure. And if we were to turn off in a single detached home, if we were to turn off all the wireless devices in the home, we usually land about a hundred, which is the daytime exposure recommendation from environmental medicine doctors. Okay. Okay. So it is kind of realistic. And in the basement of a single detached home, we're always hanging around that 10 mark, which is the nighttime exposure, the ideal pristine conditions for nighttime sleeping. And is that with all the wireless things off? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And the reason why it's lower in the, in, in the basement is we have all this earth up around us mm -hmm. and that's shielding us from the outside world on the main level. It'll be more. And if there's a second level, it'll be always be the highest because you're more line of sight to the cell towers and the things around you, right? You start getting above the trees. Okay. Well, that, yeah. I was, um, I was thinking that almost that in a basement, I mean, selfishly, I'm in a basement right now. Uh, I was kind of concerned that it would be higher down here because it'd just be bouncing off the walls more. It'd be more concentrated, but that's, that's pretty good to know that it, most of it's kind of coming from the outside in. Yeah. So when, when you turn off the things you have control over, right. You know, turn off the Wi-Fi router when you go to bed, put your phone in airplane mode and those type of things, right. That that will all reduce your exposure as low as you can possibly go. And what's remaining once you do that is what's coming in from the outside world. And when you're in the basement, you're just shielded from the outside world for the most part mm -hmm. um, because of the earth. And even a, a one foot thick concrete wall will only attenuate a wireless signal 20%. So it's going to go through cool. there fairly easily. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you had talked about how our, our cell phones, they have um, three bands of wi-fi in them well they have two bands they have the 2.4 gigahertz and the five gigahertz and soon to be a six gigahertz um probably in the next year or two um yeah and so what is this related to 5g absolutely not it has nothing to do with 5g okay. the the five gigahertz so if you log on to your wi-fi and you check out all the wi-fi networks you're going to see you know, 5G, 2.2, Yeah, okay. G and those things. So the, 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 the numbers with two and four stand for 2.4 gigahertz and the ones with 5G stand for five gigahertz when you're looking at those. Uh, 5G, I think has been around, five gigahertz, I should say, uh, Wi-Fi has been around since like 2009. It's not new at all. Um, it often gets just, just with the nomenclature, it just gets confused with 5G. 5G and five gigahertz Wi-Fi are two separate beasts. Okay. Well, that is a pretty hot topic right now. What is 5G and is it scary? Yeah, so um, 5G is comes in kind of three different flavors, okay? There's, it's called a low band, a mid band, and a high band. So if you think of this as um, sound, one would be a, 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 a deep bass, one would be a mid range, and the other one would be a high pitch sound. So the low band uh, 5G is just like 4G plus, and that's what's being rolled out in Canada and most of the US. Mm -hmm. If the average user will not notice any difference whatsoever in speed between their 4G LTE service and a 5G service, it's like a 10% increase maybe, but people won't even notice any difference with that. Um, the mid band is more like a Wi-Fi grade cellular service. So kind of think about, you know, Wi-Fi speeds that you're getting now over the cellular network. And that's kind of a mid band. And then the high band or the millimeter waves, this is the, this is the dream, right? This is downloading movies in seconds. This is self-driving cars, uh, which are just both marketing uh, ideas there. They won't really have much practical use for, for the average user. 
Um, and the millimeter waves are the ones that will be, they'll kind of be beam forming. Um, the beam forming only happens on demand. Um, so if you need to download a movie, um, it would swap from your, from your old service to the millimeter wave service for the duration in, in, in which you, you need it for. And it actually focuses the signal towards your phone. I know it sounds like Star Wars, yeah. like a tractor beam type of, <laughs> type of thing, but it, it, th this is how this technology works. Um, so, um, you know, it has, um, so what they're deploying right now is just the, the low band because it's really easy. It's almost like identical to the existing stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but the concerns are with it is it's just another layer on top of what we have already, right? We have all this wireless stuff and this is just one layer on top. It doesn't add something and then remove something. It's just adding it on top. Mm -hmm. So it's just adding our, our, our exposure. Um, when we get into the mid range and the, uh, and, and the high range or the millimeter waves, the, the biggest concern there is just like your AM radio station, sometimes you can actually pick up an AM radio station from Seattle here in Calgary uh, mm -hmm. at night, uh, but you'll never be able to pick up an FM radio station from Seattle, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is the AM, well, there's a few reasons, but one of the reasons is the AM radio station operates at a lower frequency, which means it transmits further, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the FM radio transmits at a higher frequency and it doesn't go as far. So with these mid band and, and, and millimeter wave uh, 5G, when those get deployed, they don't travel very far because they're, they're at a higher frequency or higher pitch. And so it just means they're going to have to be closer together, right? And the closer they are together, right, that distance is getting closer to where we are. So if we have those distances, it's going to increase our exposure 400%. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the major concerns. But there's several physics issues with the higher frequency stuff as well. The higher the frequency, the harder it has time to even pass through like walls of your home. And we, we thought that, you know, 4G was impossible and they figured that out. We thought 3G was impossible. They figured that out. Uh, so they'll probably figure out a way to, to, to get around this with 5G. So it passes through walls easier that may be increasing the power output of it, or um, it may be using uh, different modulations or different techniques, but it just means that our exposure is going to increase um, with this and what's most likely going to happen in residential areas. Well, they won't roll it out in residential areas at the beginning. It'll be like, you know, downtowns, places where there's lots of subscribers, but if it enters into your, your communities, um, you're going to probably need like a dish on the outside to catch the 5g and then a dish on the inside to rebroadcast it inside your home. Most likely. Okay. So you're taking that tractor beam and sucking it in here and just directing it somewhere else. Yeah, just just from a physics level. And, you know, even trees like that, when they first came out with this, and they're first testing it, it wouldn't even go through like a plane of glass, right? So trees which store a lot of water, water absorbs radio frequency radiation, um, can can have a big impact on things. So, it, you know, there's some serious physics issues, and it's really expensive to deploy. And there's some serious um, uh, energy consumptions, um, just with wireless technology in general, um, the more um, it's just not a very efficient way to deliver information. Um, you know, fiber optics is is such a uh, so so much more energy efficient uh, in a lot of cases than you know spewing out wireless radiation in 360 degrees to serve you know a few people here and there. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just not a, a very good use of energy. So with with that 5G, the high bin is that basically blanketing the Earth in. 360 degrees of coverage and then it just how does that work if like if i was like okay i'm going to turn this on to 5g now would it concentrate down to here only right so what it's going to be using is um the millimeter waves is going to be using the like the low band of 5g which is almost essentially the same as 4g right now mm -hmm. it's going to be using that for the most part Okay. And then when you need to download a large file or a large attachment, right? Something that takes some beef, what's going to happen is your phone's going to say, oh, I'm downloading a big file. I'm going to connect to the millimeter wave. They're going to direct that signal at your phone for the duration that you need it for and then turn it off. Okay. So it's kind of like an on-demand for really fast um, internet. Uh, okay. But for the most part, you're going to be hanging out at the, the low band. And the reason for that is it has the largest coverage, right? Mm -hmm. It covers the largest area. 
and it's just more efficient for, for, for them to deploy it that way. Then they're yeah. going to have these millimeter wave kind of access points that are going to beam the signal uh, to your phone. Okay. And are those access points, are they, those are cell towers? Um, they, they can come in many shapes or forms. Um, you know, most likely what's going to happen is they're going to be going on light posts and, and light standards and okay. things like that. Um, the, uh, when we talk about the, uh, the satellites delivering um, cellular signals or, or Wi-Fi or internet service, um, what's happening is, is, again, that's another layer on top of things. But what we find is the exposure is going to be quite minimal just because of the distance involved. Right. When when Google was doing their they had this Google balloon idea where they throw up a balloon and provide Wi-Fi access um, or Internet access to to a large area. And when we did the analysis of that, you know, the exposure down at the at at sea level was almost like one. Right. We were talking about 200, 100, 4.3 million. It was one. And not to say that that's not biologically harmful. It's not necessarily the the overall exposure, but how it's modulated and, and, um, you know, our body reacts non linearly to certain exposures. And one of them is electromagnetic fields, just like they give kids, you know, um, with ADHD, um, you know, a stimulant or, or, or Ritalin, they don't know why it works, but it just does. Mm -hmm. Um, and some people react differently for, 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 for different signals with, with wireless radiation. So the, the satellites are, are a concern of this, additional level in our environment. Um, but the actual exposures that we're going to be exposed to are going to be quite minimal. Okay. Yeah. My next question was going to be about Starlink and what your, uh, your thoughts on that work. Yeah. 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 And that's, that, that goes in the same, same vein, right? It's, it's going to be very low, low exposure and you're probably going to need a dish or something to concentrate those signals to actually receive that, that signal. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I got, I got one more question for you before we get into um, the, the viewers' questions, and it might be a bit long-winded, but uh, in your document, your little package, you, you talk about nine ways you can really simply um, just minimize your exposure to EMF. Can you highlight some of those or some of the ones that we haven't talked about already, like turning your breakers off and making sure that you, you know, your phone's on airplane mode? Are there any others that we haven't really explored? Yeah, one of them, and I know everyone has cell phones, so you can actually reduce your exposure from your cell phone by about 80% just by changing it from your LTE slash 4G to 3G. Mm -hmm. And in that document, you can go and and it lays it out really simply for you how, how it works for Apple phones and how it works for Android phones. And it's just something to, 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 to try out. And what you lose by switching from 4G to 3G is you're going to have a slower internet connection over the cellular network. So if you were mostly a Wi-Fi person and you do that, it's only when you're out and about, when you're in your car driving around, will you have a slower internet connection. But this slower internet connection, you'll still be able to get emails. It won't affect how Google Maps works. All these things that you use your phone for, the only thing that it's going to affect is if you download a movie, which most people don't do off their data plan anyway, yeah. Um, the movie will load in slower and it might be a little choppy. Um, so it's not that fast. So, um, but, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for Apple phones, you go to your settings, your cellular network, your cellular data options, and try to switch it off of, uh, LTE to 3G. And in Android phones, it's, it's a very similar process where you go settings, uh, cellular, cellular data network, um, and in there, it, it'll probably have, um, um, you want to change it to UTMS um, is probably the most common setting, but it's all in the, in the, in the EMF resource toolkit um, in there on, on how to do it. And it's a little bit dependent on your carrier. Your carrier is what sets those selections in your phone. It's something that gets downloaded to your phone. And uh, for example, if you're on the Bell network and you have an iPhone 12, um, it'll only allow you to switch from 5G to 4G. It doesn't allow you to switch to 3G, even though if you have an iPhone 11 with Bell, it allows you to switch to, to 3G. It just doesn't make any sense, but um, there is some limitations there. Um, and it's based on your carrier, who your, who your provider is. Mm -hmm. um, what else did I have in that list? 
Um, uh, I've got it here if you want me to. Yeah, I, I, I just got it up. Um, yeah, I think we've talked about most of them. Um, there's two here that we haven't talked about and, um, flicker is kind of becoming, uh, a kind of a, a little bit of an issue with, with just lights and led lights. Mm -hmm. And just a simple thing that you could do with your, your, your cell phone is if you switch it to the super slow motion video capture, and if you point it at some lights, what you sometimes will be able to see is actually the dimming and the brightening of the lights. So oh, some yeah. LED lights will, will have a flicker rate that we can't perceive with our eyes, uh, but yet our body can perceive this. And this works really well with monitors and TVs too, especially if you have an older monitor at home, um, the flicker on them can be quite, quite significant. So that can kind of create like migraines, uh, headaches, eye strain, um, and those type of things. And if you wanted to kind of explore the dirty electricity environment, uh, you get a portable AM radio, turn it to uh, a non-station mm -hmm. and just walk around your house, turn on all your lights, turn them off, and you'll be able to hear the dirty electricity um, if you have some um, in most cases. So it'll, yeah. you'll, you'll see a, a pitch change. Uh, it'll, it'll sound more angry. Um, and, uh, and you can kind of just explore that uh, if you want. Cool. What about uh, baby monitors? I'm sure a lot of people are a little bit like, whoa, I, that's, I can't do that. Yeah. So um, th this is kind of one that's a, a little tougher sell. Um, and, you know, people take a lot of care um, and they get a little bit of peace of mind with the baby monitors. And one of the things that we often ask people about is what do you use the baby monitor for, right? Uh, a good use of a, not that there is a good use, but a preferred use if you had to use it is if you wanted to watch TV and relax and chill out mm -hmm. uh, for an hour before you go to bed, you know, turn the baby monitor on for, for an hour. Um, that's not ideal by any stretch of the means from my perspective, but it's not the end of the world either because it's for a short duration. Mm -hmm. What I really would encourage people to, to try out is, you know, can you place, can you change up the sleeping arrangement in the home so that there isn't a large distance between you and the child, mm -hmm. right? In, in our home, we're lucky that on the main level, we had our, our my, my son's room and the kitchen and the living room all on the same floor, right? So, you know, we just used our ears um, as, as our baby monitor. And that's not always the case in certain homes and in certain con configurations. Uh, but if you can set it up so the sleeping areas are close to each other within an earshot, uh, so at night we don't have to have the baby monitor on 24-7, mm -hmm. that is such an ideal case. Um, the baby monitors, much like your Wi-Fi, send pulse radiation 24-7. And it's to the, uh, sometimes it's to the monitor that the parents have, but it's always at the monitor at the, at, at, at the baby's crib um, level. Um, so if you can, you know, just minimize your use of that. And sometimes people notice a huge impact on the quality of sleep of their kids as well. You know, just, you know, the amount of time that kids need to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just something to experiment, right? Like, you know, unplug it, you know, keep it unplugged for a few days, see if you notice a big difference. And a lot of people will. And as soon as they see that, you know, it becomes a no brainer to keep it off and mm -hmm. they'll find a way to, to, to kind of make that work. Um, and, uh, but it's, 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 it's a, it's kind of a delicate situation. And, and some people have just put, hooked up a wired camera in the room. Right. And uh, real link is one. There's, there's a few others that, that, that could work and it, it's, it's imperfect, right? Like, but you'll still be able to monitor them um, through yeah. a hardwired connection. Um, so kind of explore that as well. Okay, cool. Um, well, let's get to some uh, viewer questions here, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, our first question is from Veda, and she's saying, slash asking, they were proposing one of those huge power lines on our land, just on the opposite side of our corridor from our house. How much would that affect us? 
Yeah. So power lines are an interesting thing. Um, uh, the general rule of thumb is usually within a hundred meters to 200 meters. It's a non-issue. Um, but anything within that range is kind of a gray area and we can't tell what the exposure is just by looking at the power line, unfortunately. So what happens with power lines is the demand of power changes throughout the day, throughout the season and from year to year. Yeah. So what happens when we evaluate power lines is we kind of take uh, measurements back from the power lines through to the home or, or, or the property. So you see the fall off of the field, but that field will change and fluctuate with the demand of power. So if there's more power going through there, the field is going to expand. And so oftentimes what we do is we ask the utility company, what was the loading of the line when we took the measurements, right? If it was 80% loaded, we can say easily say that this is the worst case scenario, right? If it was only 20% loaded, right? When we took that, that measurement, that means that in the future, we're consuming more and more power as, as we go through. Chances are that that field is going to expand. So if it was 20%, it'll expand five times larger than, than what it was mm -hmm. uh, potentially. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to say, but if she's talking about a quarter section, she probably has a pretty decent distance um, from there. Um, you know, we don't hear about it too much, but um, usually just wherever you have transmission lines, um, you will have a higher flow of electricity through the ground underneath them. Mm -hmm. um, as well. Sometimes that affects livestock. Um, it's called ground current um, as well. So that's also just kind of a, a, a consideration um, uh, when it comes to those power lines as well. I know this probably is talking uh, a little bit more on, a, on an agricultural and uh, scale. Mm -hmm. but those are just some ideas, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's just something that we need to measure it and ask for, for some information from the utility company. From that, we can estimate what your exposure is for a year, a month, and or what the worst case was for a year, what your average exposure for a year was, and what the worst case scenario will be with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Aaron, and they are asking, what are the most current, concise EMF exposure scientific studies that can be used to convince employers or government officials that this is a serious problem? Yeah. Um, so here is kind of the, the, the issue that we're in right now. And I'll, I'll give some examples of, of, of some specific resources. There is an inconvenience of our government acknowledging that there is a problem. If they actually acknowledge that this is a problem, they're going to have to do something about it. And unfortunately, there isn't an ideal solution for our government to, to do something about this. Our government, whether it be the US or Canada, they sell spectrum to telecom companies. This is like a multi-billion dollar um, investment that the telecoms make or money that they give, the telecoms give to the government. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, these auctions that, that go on is a big money maker. Uh, for the government. And these are also the same government that has to regulate the safety guidelines for it. So there's just a huge conflict of interest is one thing. And the other thing is they don't have uh, the good solution. The solution that should be happening is we shouldn't be rolling out as much wireless technology and we should be dialing back the power that these devices are actually putting out, basically just restricting the amount of this stuff. Um, and, you know, if we had one internet service per, or cell phone service provider, we wouldn't need all these cell towers. We would have cell towers in key locations with antennas versus now we have so many different providers. They all have to have their own antennas and their own infrastructure. And that increases our exposure mm -hmm. with it. So um, the best information that I have is in the six items that are in the EMF resource toolkit. Um, one of them is the European environmental medicine doctors. So if you talk to industry experts, physicists, engineers, um, you're going to get one story. 
if you talk to environmental medicine doctors who focus in, on getting people better from environmental illness, they're going to have a much different story, Absolutely. right? These are the people on the front lines actually solving problems, mm -hmm. not selling stuff, which the engineers and, and the others are. So, uh, so the European, it's called the European Academy of Environmental Medicine 2016 EMF guidelines is 30 pages long. It has gobs of references and tells you why they came up with the guidelines that they did. Um, so it's a really good from a medical perspective. If you want to give this to your doctors, if you want to understand kind of what the implications are from a medical standpoint, mm -hmm. it is the best document. Okay. If you want, you know, 1800 more studies to look through, look at the bio initiative report. Bio initiative. Okay. It gets slammed a little bit because it doesn't give a balanced approach to this. Mm -hmm. They focus mostly in on the ones that caused biological, that had biological impacts. And that was the whole design of the bio initiative report. They wanted to shed light on the studies that showed bio, um, biological effects mm -hmm. other than thermal heating. Um, the other one is the, uh, it's called the NTP study, the National Toxicology Study, $30 million study. Uh, was uh, done impeccably well. Uh, the Reader's Digest version of the study is they found uh, cancers of the in the brain, uh, the the acoustic nerve, and in the heart. And these are very rare forms of tumors and cancers and disease. And they found it in multiple parts of our body. Um, and this was on rats and mice. Um, and the interesting thing is that. The, the, uh, the, the toxicology program is the gold standard in the U S for looking at toxins. And, um, every time that we found a car car carcinogen in rats and mice, it is translated into humans. So we've never not found something that was in rice, rats and mice that didn't translate to humans. And this was found. And, um, it's been brushed off a little bit saying that, you know, these are rats and mice. It doesn't apply to humans. Um, but that is the gold standard. That's how we do this. We don't do experiments on humans. Um, we do it on, on, on animals, um, to do that. So that's the NTP study. Um, what else is out there? Um, the Canadians for, for safe technologies is run by the ex CEO of Microsoft Canada, Frank Clegg. He's keeping a, a good heartbeat on what's going on here in Canada. Uh, the environmental health trust has gobs of information. Uh, in the US, uh, highly recommend um, checking them out. And um, the um, it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to, to broach the subject uh, because there is no like quick little sound bite on this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can say like, you know, the World Health, Health Organization in 2011 considers radio frequency radiation as a possible human carcinogen right? That has not been rescinded. That still exists. Yeah. And uh, Leonard Hardell, which was one of the people who worked on that classification, now says that it's either probable or is a carcinogen. And there's four other scientists that were on that original um, World Health Organization classified it as a, a possible human carcinogen that say it is a probable at minimum and maybe is a known carcinogen. Um, so those are good starting points. Um, for that, um, yeah, that's probably as much time as I want to spend on that. I can talk for about that one for, yeah, for a while, but that's, that's a big, that's a doozy. Yeah. Um, all right. The next question is from S Yoma and they're asking or saying rather, I stopped using microwave currently using countertop smart toaster oven. Are there health risks, health risk factors associated with this? Okay, so it sounds like she had a smart oven. Is that is that how you understood that? Um, yeah, a countertop smart toaster oven. Smart toaster oven. Yeah. So when you're when you're saying smart, I, I assume that means that it has a wireless transmitter in it. Um, and you can always tell if something has a wireless transmitter in it, whether this be your smartphone, um, your smart meter on your house, um, your fridge, um, the RF remote for your TV. What you do is you look at the fine print where it says like the model number on it. 
and you look for the words FCC ID, mm -hmm. right? Or IC, or it, sometimes it just says Canada with a colon on it. And then there's going to be some numbers and letters um, th that are after that. If it has an FCC ID, an IC, or a Canada with a colon on it with a bunch of gobbledygook, um, that is the license that they've registered that device with, with Industry Canada or with the FCC. And that means it has a transmitter built into it. Um, so just check on your toaster oven, make sure it has an FCC ID or an IC ID on it. If it does, then it does have a wireless device in it. Then the next step is to see if you can open up the manual or, or give the manufacturer a call to see if you can disable that wireless device inside there. Uh, for fridges, it's, it's kind of hard to do. You can do it uh, the old fashioned way of actually unplugging the Wi-Fi module. The same thing works with smart TVs if you're having problems with it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, check first to see if it has that FCC ID or the IC ID. Um, and, uh, it's, it's probably if it, if it does have a transmitter in it, it's probably transmitting 24 seven, whether you're using the toaster oven or not. Um, and that's the, that's the risk. So, um, different ways that you might be able to mitigate that is you might just put your toaster oven on a power bar, turn it on when you're using it and turn it off when you don't. Imagine most of the time it'll be off, uh, so it won't be transmitting anything. And then it's only transmitting when you actually need to use that device. Mm -hmm. The same thing works with TVs, um, you know, uh, you know, um, a lot of gaming consoles transmit 24 seven and those type of things. Uh, but if you put it on a power bar, turn the power bar on when you need it, turn it off when you don't, that's great. Um, uh, I know when it comes from a compliance standpoint, um, I tell people to do this. They say, yes, yes, yes. Nod their head. I come back six months later and the power bar is just left on. Um, so you have to be really diligent about it. There's some other tools out there that we use to automatically turn things off after a set time, an off delay timer that works well um, uh, for those type of things as well. So you don't have to forget to turn off the power bar. All right. Um, Rob Avis was asking about Starlink and Bluetooth headsets, uh, but we addressed both of those. So I'll just um, get it. <laughs> <laughs> to watch. Um, this next question is from Reliance on Trust, and they are asking, 5G is 60 gigahertz. No? Like a magnitude or more higher than 2.4 gigahertz. So that 60 gigahertz that he's talking about is the millimeter waves. So the millimeter waves are going to be happening at, two, at 24 gigahertz and up. Um, and yeah, so the 60 gigahertz would be considered a millimeter wave. Uh, but most of what's being deployed is at the 2.6 gigahertz in, right, or the sub three gigahertz range in, in Canada and in the US, which is the exact same frequencies of the existing cell phone um, providers that are out there. So again, it's just this other layer on top of it. And the millimeter wave stuff, they just have some serious physics things to, to, to sort through, and it's the most complicated one. So those are going to happen later. Okay. Uh, next question is from Aaron again. Uh, they're asking, is there a market for this type of consulting? Is it a field that will grow in the near future? Yeah, so I'm an instructor with the, with the Building Biology Institute who teach people how to do this for a living. And it's the most comprehensive program out there to t for people who want to get, get into this. Um, and usually what we do is we have a basic a one week seminar. There's a bunch of online courses that you take up to this point. Then there's a, a, a basic EMF seminar with a bunch of labs that we do for one week. And we do that on a yearly basis. And we do an advanced course every two years. And this year we had to run two of the advanced courses back to back in November and December, virtually online, just to meet the demand of this. Oh. Um, so, um, which we've never had to do. Um, so, you know, it's been, uh, there's been like a few 5G summits th that have happened and the whole COVID thing for better or for worse. Um, and that the whole talk about 5G, it just increased the conversation. I don't necessarily like the way the conversation has been going uh, with the 5G and COVID stuff, but um, it, uh, it just has increased awareness and curiosity in people. So it is, a, it, it is an emerging field. It's been around for over 40 years. Um, it's not a new field by any stretch of the means. It's just getting more and more popular. And, right. and we're just, our exposure is going up exponentially. Yeah. So it's a, it's a booming 
give them time to get in if people want to learn about more and, and help other people. Yeah. Um, which you're very good at. And so this leads to the next question is um, what, this is from Rob and he's asking, what services do you offer to help us with EMF in our home and where can they, where can people find out about it? Yeah, for sure. So um, the, the, we work with medical doctors, functional medicine doctors with their patients. That's primarily how, how I got into this um, and our, my main clientele, but now it's more opened up to the general population. So the general assessment that we do uh, the, the complete home assessment is just to springboard you into action and to figure out what your exposure is and what you can do about it. Um, and that looks at the four main types of electromagnetic fields, uh, the human created ones, the wireless technology, electric and magnetic fields from the electricity flowing in and around your home, the dirty electricity or the electrical noise that's flowing around. And we also look at the lighting in your home and make recommendations um, on that as well. Um, the average uh, home with two bedrooms takes about four hours to, to go through uh, thoroughly and costs about $500 uh, plus GST. Um, and this is the most effective way to kind of get to the bottom of everything and, and lay everything out and figure out what the solutions are and just give you that peace of mind that you need to, to, to make action. A lot of people are just living in this fear where they don't know what their exposure is. You can't see this stuff. And oftentimes they're, they're more relieved when I leave than, than when I came in, just because, you know, everything, most, they can reduce their exposure by 80% by just changing, just changing what's inside their home, yeah. uh, which is huge. Um, we also do uh, a design build uh, for low EMF designs. Uh, we're currently working on a couple homes right now uh, through that process. So that's the best time and the most economic time to deal with these EMF issues. Uh, there's some really small tweaks that we can make to to the electrical design and and just the wiring in your house, the low voltage stuff. Um, you know, if you're planning on putting in a, a Tesla car charger and those type of things, there's some special filtering that we would put in place to help deal with some electrical noise that comes off of that. Um, and then we also do some workplace stuff as well. But but that's the primary um, things. If if you want more information, just go to emfaware.ca um, and uh, there's a, there's a form you can fill out there that gives us all the information you need under schedule a consult uh, mm -hmm. for us to, to provide a quote to, to help you out. Awesome. Well, I have uh, one, one more question for you. It's the question I like to wrap up the interview with. Um, uh, so it's a total hypothetical situation and you have been made the minister of education um, for any, any country or the whole world, doesn't matter. And you have to choose between one and three books that every high school graduate has to read. Which books are they and why? Three books. Or up to three books. Could be one, up could to be three. three. Books. Um, one of them is called The Body Electric by Robert Becker. And Robert Becker was one of the pioneers of looking at using electromagnetic fields and the interaction with, with biology, essentially. Mm -hmm. And he was fascinated with salamanders, how they can grow back their appendages when cut off. And he was the first person. And if you go up one step from, in evolution to the frog, the frog can't do this, right? The salamander, I think, can even grow back a third of its brain or something if you cut it out. So what he did was he was the first person to apply um, the field of, you know, EMF fields or a small electric current to a frog's leg after it was severed and the frog grew back the whole leg. Whoa. And th this has been known, this has been replicated. This is, this is, th th this has been known. They use this now to increase, um, decrease the time it takes to heal bones um, and fractures and, and, you know, but he was kind of the first person to do this. And this is in the, I don't know, the sixties or seventies or something, uh, wh where he did this. Uh, but it goes into electromagnetic fields and the interaction with the, with biology and it's called the body electric, uh, by Robert Becker. Um, and it's just really one of those eye opening kind of books. It's been, you know, it's readily available, but it's been around for a while. And uh, I just wish more people would be able to, to read that book. And, you know, that doesn't get into politics. It doesn't get into anything. It's just 
biology and EMFs. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Any others? Um, I'm going to just leave it at there. There's a whole bunch of other ones, but, um, I want to, if they read one, I want them to read that one. And I don't want them to get on these other side adventures. Yeah. All good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me about all this really stuff and uh, helping me become more EMF aware. And I, I'm certainly interested and in, I'm going to change, change some things around. Yeah. Just do some experimenting, check out that, that resource kit, like go through those nine items, try out this, the Jelter and Sage protocol, which everyone can do without spending a penny. Um, right. And just start exploring this a little bit. And, you know, if you have those aha moments or those, you know, it just makes you go even further with it. Um, you know, it's, it's been an extremely rewarding uh, profession for me to, to, to work with, you know, functional medicine doctors, you know, people with babies and, and, and pregnant women and all this type yeah. of stuff and see the changes that, that, that have been happening. It's just, it's just been an amazing adventure. So I just wish more people knew about it. Um, and I think more people are learning about it. So, so check those out. And, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mitch. And all right. we'll, uh, we'll talk in the future.